Hi, I'm Fred Mills and I'm smiling because today we have a truly awesome panel of people from across the globe to discuss the world of digital twins in architecture, engineering and construction in the design, creation and operation of the buildings and infrastructure that shape all of our lives. Now we're going to meet them properly in just a moment, but first of all, a quick hello from each of them. Firstly, just across town from me in a rather locked down London is my co-host for today, David from Epic Games. How are you doing? Hey guys, how are we doing? Good to be here. I'm excited. Uh, Salah's joining us from Microsoft in Seattle. Hi, Salah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me on, on this discussion as well. It's a pleasure. Uh, and Tim's joining us from right across the other side of the world from me in Auckland, New Zealand. How are you doing, Tim? Hey, everybody. Yeah, no, very well, thank you. Thanks for having me here. It's awesome. Fantastic. You can see we have a truly global panel today across three different continents. This has all been carefully calibrated into the one time of day that we're all awake and actually conscious, which is always good for a panel. Uh, but yeah, fantastic to be here with this, with this amazing group of people. Before we hear from this fantastic panel, I really want to set the scene of digital twins in the architecture, engineering and construction space in the AEC space. I love this industry and I've always understood its potential to shape people's lives and impact billions around the planet. For me, those conversations that happened in that technical world of engineering or the conversations we have in architecture practices or on construction sites actually affects all of us. The homes we wake up in shape our outlook for the day and our physical and mental health. The schools we send our children to shape them for life. The hospitals we use, the infrastructure we depend on, the infrastructure that we use for traveling and to draw our energy, all of it comes from the construction industry, which is why for me, it's absolutely critical that we get our built environment right. That's why I founded the B1M, which is the world's largest and most subscribed to video channel for construction. I wanted to show the world how amazing this industry is and just how big an impact it really has. My understanding of the impact these industries can have is why I'm so excited and intrigued by the potential of digital twin technology. We've seen the impact this can have in other sectors, from those working on deep space exploration to aviation, but it's AEC where we can make a really big difference. If we can truly understand how our built world is performing, we can learn from that, we can improve that performance, and we can quite literally build a better world for us all to live our lives in. But we're at a bit of an interesting moment in our adoption of this technology. What do we really mean by the term digital twin? What are the benefits of having one? Do you need one? How do you get started? And where is all this heading in the years ahead? Well, to answer all these questions and more, I'm excited and to be honest, a little bit relieved to be joined by some fantastic experts from around the world. Let's now meet them properly. Firstly, coming to you, Salah, in Seattle uh, from Microsoft, where, do you, where are you kind of coming from with this? What's your background? Thank you. Uh, so my background is that I'm an architect by training, but then uh, I've been a tourist in the built environment industry for 20 years now, uh, covering the full spectrum of different disciplines and, and roles in the industry from uh, being an academic researcher and, and then applied research and development researcher and then a few years of uh, architectural design and structural engineering. And when I moved to United States, I hopped on the dark side of the industry, general contracting, um, where I saw what kind of digital transformation uh, op opportunities are there. And now I work for the internal real estate and security at Microsoft, but also helping out our technologists and uh, uh, developers to uh, serve the built environment industry and develop technology that is uh, applicable for all. And Tim, you're doing some pretty incredible stuff in New Zealand. Yeah, well, I started uh, my uh, career in uh, aerial photography and, and mapping. Um, and I did that for a few years before uh, actually studying architecture. Um, so uh, yeah, after architecture, um, I found a, a, a real passion uh, for visualization and uh, 3D graphics. Um, and basically uh, joined Build Media and, and soon bought into the company. Um, so I'm a co-owner with Gareth Ross here at Build Media and uh, for the last 17 years I think we've been uh, visualizing uh, architecture, infrastructure um, and now for the past four or five years we've been sort of looking at uh, experiences and using Unreal Engine to present these projects in a unique and really sort of uh, interesting way. So yeah, a little bit of a varied background but it's, it's been a very exciting experience over the last 20 years. That's fantastic. And David, you're joining us from Epic Games, but before that, bringing a really wealth of experience from the architecture and construction sectors. 
Indeed, yeah. Um, so yeah, I've come from the architecture um, side of things, um, and I was always really interested in how technology could not only sort of help us um, along the design process, but actually help us to design smarter and better buildings and um, to kind of improve the world around us. So I was always very interested in digital twins, um, and I now work with Epic Games and the AC Enterprise team, and we get to speak to amazing people um, like Sal and like Tim and um, and how sort of these architectural engineering construction firms are actually utilizing um, the Unreal Engine um, in their workflows and um, with also a primary focus around digital twins. So um, yeah, that's, that's a little bit about me. Awesome, great to be talking to you all today, literally from around the world. Um, I'm gonna start with a deliberately simple question, but I think it's gonna be quite a big talking point. If I was to ask each of you to say, what is a digital twin? What would you say back to me? If I had a nickel. <laughs> you, can go, you can go first, David. <laughs> it's actually a really um, diverse topic, and um, you know we're constantly hearing different definitions of it. And I think part of um, you know what we're very keen to do as a whole industry is actually define it and sort of put our finger on exactly what it is, so we can all move forward. Um, so yeah, for me, I think that it's definitely looking at the, um, you know the obvious of the digital representation of the physical asset. But I always think there needs to be some form of live data stream involved in it and um, that live connection to the real world for it to make sense. Absolutely. I mean, Salah, I'm interested in your view on this as well. What would you say? Uh, it, it's still under development by the Digital Twin Consortium that has uh, over 200 members already pondering what digital twins are. But um, for me, it, it is a framework for uh, creating the digital truth about the physical environment phenomena and explaining to us as decision makers that what is the cause and effect of something happening in our built environment. And that way we can use digital twins for preventing inc incidents from happening and issues from accumulating to uh, problems. So uh, it's, it's basically easier to define what digital twin is. And it's certainly not a veneer for building information models, for example, or for a, a database. Uh, it's, it's something much more and it's something that is very disruptive for all the industries that are now adapting to it. I agree with Sal. I like your answer better than mine. I think it <laughs> definitely sounded better. <laughs> Tim, what's, what's your view? I, I suppose I've got a very simple view of it. Uh, well, I could probably try and make it as simple as possible. I think uh, for me, um, there's the thing that's in, in the real world uh, that's generating real-time data. Um, and then for the digital twin, uh, it needs to represent the thing. So either a model or, or maybe a diagram or, or some sort of representation of that thing. Um, it's connected to it through um, IoT sensors um, or, or some other form of, of, of connection. Um, and the digital twin needs to act like the thing. So you could then simulate from it, learn from it, and then basically take that back to the physical uh, object. So that's probably a, a real oversimplification of it. Um, but I feel like that sort of captures most of most of it. No, and I love it. it it's part of this um, thing that I think that digital twins have been around for a lot longer than we realize. I think mm. the what's happening now is, that, and it's funny because they've been around for so long, but we're still kind of now deciding what does it actually mean? I mean, we've all, we've had sensors in buildings for a long time. We've had this data for a long time, and we've obviously been working in 3D for a long time. So the, the really interesting around it is why is it that now we're having such an issue in trying to sort of define it, considering it technically, um, in some essence, has been around for so long? Um, is it the fact that we're all now trying to maybe join it together? Um, so I think it, it, it's an interesting, and it, it is an interesting sort of discussion, and there's no answer to it, which I think is probably the magic at the moment. And, and I'm really putting it on Sal here to um, help define it for everyone. So um, I think you're on the right path. I think, I guess, for those people watching who are trying to unpack this and work out how they get started, the fact that there is no clear handle on what a digital twin is, is, I guess, pretty unhelpful for people, isn't it? But I think being, being clear, what we're saying is it's, and we've talked about it here, that it's that, it's that link between the digital and the physical. This isn't just a digital model of your building or city districts. There's a link between the two things, and that's what makes it a digital twin. Exactly. And a digital twin is not a single entity. It, it has multitudes of different components and, and layers into it. And really, depending on who the end user of the digital twin is, the components might vary. 
um, an analogy that I've been using at the Digital Twin Consortium sometimes is uh, think about the smartphone. That if you buy a same smartphone as the rest of us and you start using it, it's in less than five minutes that your smartphone experience is different from mine because you choose which components are part of your smartphone experience. So that way it's the same thing with the digital twin, that if you're an architect, different components are important to you compared to a real estate owner, for example. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, from my perspective, it, it, it is blurry, but well, it's blurry because, you know, yeah, since something like the 1970s, people have been using digital twins in engineering and, you know, for product and that type of thing. But when it comes to cities <laughs> or buildings, they're, they're, highly highly complex there's there's just so many moving parts and um each person whether they're a planner an architect or uh you know an urban designer uh, 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 wanting to use these models for different reasons so um i suppose from my experience in terms of you know us trying to create something in, in a city um you know it's, it's actually a bunch of different digital twins all kind of trying to work together and you're utilizing data from different ones, you know, for different purposes. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's very complex. That's a, a key question I've got is, is this one of those things, as David was saying, as you've all been saying, it's been around for a long time, other industries have done this. Is this one of those things like offsite manufacturing, you know, all that kind of stuff where construction looks at other industries and goes, oh, look, they're doing it. They've done it for years. They're doing it great. Why can't we do it in construction? But actually the problem is every building's different. Everything we do is a prototype every time effectively. And that's the challenge. Is, is that why it hasn't been kind of taken up widely across construction yet, do you think? That might be, because it's uh, where we are looking for references is from the process industry, from automotive or all um, refinement industries. And it is exactly like you said, that it's a project based industry with very long projects. Thinking about the, the technical life cycle for building is it, it could be tens of years. Or if, if we think about the digital building life cycle, it goes on for hundreds of years, hopefully. Um, and that way, the, the overall life cycle and, and what the changes are and how much the end users are actually changing the built environment, there are multiple factors into uh, what is then the final outcome of, of it all. And then uh, what are the variables? So it's, uh, it's probably the most complicated industry in the world that we are dealing with. Uh, and it's also the least digitized. So we are dealing with a lot of uh, big data that oftentimes remains as dark data because it's still a very manual industry to begin with. So there, there's a lot of complexity, but a lot of opportunity uh, in the digital twins in the built environment industry. I think there's also just this split of um, sort of ownership and um, sort of silos within the AC industry in the sense that there are people who obviously design and would love to design with the data at the beginning of the process but then are they part of that process at the end of construction are they part of that process during operation I think that the fragmentation across all the different roles and um, provides a lot of opportunities for um, each of those silos. But I think with, when we're talking about digital twins, where the data at the end of the process is what then feeds in back into the start of the process, there needs to be this connectivity and there needs to be this sort of working together mentality in order to actually utilize them that maybe other industries don't have that sort of problem and maybe they don't have that kind of communication blockade where everything is very fragmented. Going to this this kind of link, so there's we just explaining for people watching. There's there's a digital model which is the, the the digital twin, but in the physical asset, how do we how do we get that information from the physical asset? How what powers digital twins? How does this how does this kind of work? Um, I can start. I think the the biggest part of the digital twin um, sort of creation is actually having that data to work with. Um, so we'll take the, the kind of obvious one out of the way first and say, let's, we probably have a 3D model of some kind, or we have a 3D digital representation because we have that from the early design phases. Um, I would say the next sort of crucial part is understanding where your data is and what data you're actually looking to have as part of that um, experience or have as part of that understanding of the future building. Um, so I'd say the next step is obviously looking at where that data is coming from. Is this public data? Is this private data? Is this going to be something which you're setting up? And, and I would say a, a huge chunk, I would say really looking at about 80 or 90% of the process around digital twins really comes from the understanding and the collection of that data. 
Um, and how you manage that and how that's stored is really crucial to then what you can do with it and how you can then move beyond to make it help or start to help you make decisions um, that could better the building or better the built environment. From, from our experience, I suppose, uh, you know, working with uh, Wellington Council, what we've found is all these silos of, of data, <laughs> which seems to be very fragmented or broken up. You know, people are collecting it from all sorts of different locations. Um, you know, I think we were maybe a little naive and we started the process of actually um, exploring digital twins that all this IoT data is just going to be in one place and we could start pulling it in and, you know, playing with it. Um, what we found was actually it's just it's just everywhere. <laughs> and yeah, you know, people have different reasons for collecting that data. And what, what we found was we, we needed to define a problem first that we wanted to sort of uh, solve to then start exploring that IoT data um, so that, you know, we were collecting the right sort of information for us to try and, you know, explore that problem. For Wellington Council, I know that they've, they've spent the last seven years, I think they've, they've been exploring IoT sensors and, and with a whole range of different systems. So it's all sort of in silos right now, but they are working through this process of actually bringing that together um, into one or two, or three maybe, uh, systems, uh, which is, becomes a little bit more easier to, for people to access. So what, what kinds of data are we talking about? Is it information on heating performance, building usage, uh, you know, climate control? What, what's, what's, what do we mean by this data? It's very wide and varied. Uh, everything from buses, trains, cycling, cars, uh, ferries, aircraft. <laughs> And I think that's what's really exciting about your the Wellington project is that you, whenever you're dealing with a digital twin on that kind of scale and size, you know, the factors that you're looking at are on a much larger scale. You know, transport can be looked at in that scale. You know, you can't look at transport in under a kind of a microscope with things like buildings or things like building assets. So you just have this opportunity with the kind of size and scale of digital twin which you guys are working on to have to actually take a step back and see how this larger infrastructure for a country or, an or, or a city council actually works. So I really love that that is a very unique use case for digital twins that whenever we kind of start to zoom in and get smaller to maybe a, a building, it changes again. And then whenever you go smaller still and look at a building asset like uh, mechanical equipment or even a person's desk or all the way down to, you know, smartwatches, um, just the data range changes, but each one has such a unique sort of data set and um, different points that you can measure. Um, so I, I find that a really interesting sort of um, development, see where it gets used and how it gets used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that kind of aggregate trend level stuff that matters, isn't it? Like you say, like an individual's journey or what they've been doing in a city that day isn't that impactful. But if you can see it on a trend level, if you can see it at an aggregate level, that's where you can really get the learning. And when you feed that kind of data back into how you plan a city, how you design your next building, that's that's huge. Yeah, it, it definitely is a question of what is the data collection strategy? And I oftentimes ask people that, what are you planning on doing with the data? And that way, when, when we understand what data we are collecting, it's tied into the, the clusters of information that, that we use as the base point for knowledge. We already have to have uh, an application of that information in mind so then we can then backtrack what are the data streams that we want to be harmonizing and managing, but with the total performance in mind. If we are thinking about the end users and how we want to make the best end user experiences, then we have to understand the Internet of Actions data and the Internet of Things data that we can then combine and see that how do we actually deliver the outcome that we want to. So how, how are Microsoft helping power some of this? What are some of the, the tools that you guys are putting out there that enable people to make that link between the physical and the digital? Well, we have uh, the fa fabulous Azure stack and Azure Digital Twins that is pretty much in the framework of uh, digital, digital twins overall. So uh, there is a lot of technology that already exists off the shelf. And we have beautiful partners like Epic Games uh, working with us to integrate more technology together and that way bridge the, the technologies that are supportive of each other. And that way there is no all promising of one stop so shop solution that one solution or one company can solve it all. But it's more about the partnerships and, and how we can uh, bridge the technologies together to uh, make that best end user experience. Awesome. I guess uh, crossing on to like 
the kind of the so what and why does this matter? I, I as I kind of said in my intro, I, I really understand the the value proposition of digital twins, and it's incredibly exciting and intriguing about you know if we did this worldwide on every building, the impact it could have to all of our lives would be absolutely enormous. But I guess speaking speaking to those people who aren't on this panel discussion, who are the skeptics, I guess a skeptic would say we've built cities and buildings for centuries and it's all been fine you know climate change and quality of living aside it's all been fine we've been doing this for centuries why do we need digital twins what's the point in doing this now it's not going to make any difference is it uh, yep. i love how you said despite the environmental despite the sustainability in the world <laughs> despite sorry. the fundamental oh, impact right. have, uh, was, uh, 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 to worry about that. <laughs> why i think we probably could do with this data um i think that it's this notion of um trying to make things better let's and again we can just put a pin in that for now we'll, we'll, we'll come back to it um, I think it's just this way that um, it's this feedback loop or this design iteration loop. You know, this idea that we designed something once and it, it ended up perfect is just, it's a really weird notion. You know, I think with in the early stages of design all the way through, we're always looking to refine that process, make it more affordable, make it more sustainable. Um, and at the moment, we work on this idea that we build something and we prototype it and we see how it works. And if it doesn't work, then that's a costly mistake to make. Um, I think my favorite quote ever is, um, if you think good design costs a lot of money, wait till you see the cost of a bad one. Um, and <laughs> it, it, it's this idea that, you know, if we had some way to feed back that information quicker and faster into the design decisions and the early process that would not take years to develop, um, it would actually really help us know what is not working and what is working within a building. Um, I'll, I'll come back to the sustainability thing in a second. I was about to comment that the, the question itself already had the answer in it, that we've been building buildings for centuries now. Uh, so now they are at the technical life cycle end. Even those that were built in the mid-century, now they are coming to the age that we actually have to do the big renovations and retrofits. And if we don't have any clue about what is wrong, what needs to be improved, how might we actually improve them or elevate the, t uh, the total performance of our built environment? It's a shot in the dark. Uh, you cannot guesstimate your budgets uh, anymore. Um, I'm more using the word cost engineering. That's what I'm hoping for from Digital Twins, that we can be more precise. We can really target what we are actually improving. We can make more educated decisions about where we are investing uh, and overall have more collaborative project delivery throughout the, the industry so that we are not just uh, doing things as we did yesterday or based on what our personal experience is over the, the decades but we really look into what is the evidence and the data telling us and how do we interpret that as professionals. From a, from a city scale, I think um, going back to what David was, was, was talking about earlier, it's about making decisions faster um, and, and, but, but informed decisions. Um, so, you know, some of the traditional formats that we've been working on as well, I call them traditional saying it's got this great big 3D model, but you know some of the the, the, the formats that we've been working with in the past are around, let's say, uh, you know, the visual impact of a new building in, in a cityscape. You know, where you have to create a, a visual simulation of, um, of, of of basically how that building will fit in in the greater context. Um, you know, to, to generate that takes time. Um, you have to survey the site. You have to. Uh, you know, make sure that the camera position is accurate and that you're rendering the, the, the building within that image um, accurately. Whereas if you have the ability of having a very high fidelity 3D model that you can, you know, get into Unreal Engine and then, uh, you know, as long as everything's coordinated and geolocated correctly, plugging that architectural building into that model and then be able to simulate things like, uh, you know, shadow studies, um, maybe wind behavior, um, you know, based off information that you've maybe pulled from other IoT sensors within the city um, is, is in, in, incredibly powerful. Um, and it's empowering as well for, for those urban designers and planners to, to be able to use a tool like that and actually feel confident around that, the, the decision making. You know, that's, that's the big one. Yeah. Yeah, that's the answer, isn't it? I mean, yes, we've been building cities and buildings for centuries, but look at the planet today. We're not exactly in a perfect place, are we? You know, and, and buildings account for something like 40% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. So, I mean, just on the climate change thing, if we can understand how our buildings are performing and using energy and 
make a, a sizable impact on the amount of carbon emissions we put out through our buildings, that alone is a huge win, let alone you know, the quality of housing that people are in across different societies and countries, let alone the quality of schools and hospitals. You know, it gets it kind of gets a bit big for your brain to compute, but we are literally talking here about, you know, if we get this right, if we learn from this, in that next generation of buildings, we can build a better world. It sounds a bit cheesy when I say that, but I, <laughs> it's that's kind of what it's about, isn't it? We're at this amazing point in time, and <laughs> these people who maybe uh, are wondering sort of why we need this, I think we've actually been ramping up to this for a long time, and we're in a really great position now. Um, with the introduction of even BIM, you know, we are now have a better understanding of how our buildings um, are constructed and have a database on, you know, the installation that's used, the wall thicknesses, the U values. So these BIM tools actually give us this great data framework of how these buildings are operated. So we've been ramping up and using, utilizing these data points for a while. But now what we can do is we can put those data points to good use. Um, and technology has never been at a better place to start this as well. And um, we look at sort of the amazing infrastructure around sort of what Microsoft are doing with the Azure Digital Twin product. We look at the um, way that the Unreal Engine can visualize and get these tools into the hands of people anywhere around the world in a sort of very easy to understand format, like what Build Media are doing. I think that we're just at this point now where it's almost like, why wouldn't we? and start looking at digital twins and, and why wouldn't we start jumping on this now that everything is actually available and ready for us I'd, i guess i'd like to think that anyone watching can kind of follow the logic of our conversation and they probably like completely get the purpose of digital twins but for those kind of you know the regional councils uh, regional governments around the world in each of our countries that are faced with you know providing public housing state housing uh, hospitals schools rail infrastructure you know all that kind of stuff they they've got this immense cost challenge all the time and they look at the world of digital twins they just think that's that's a step too far for us we, we can barely do what we're trying to do let alone something else is it is it something that's going to make their lives easier ultimately or is it another hurdle to go through i know the answer <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think um you know it's it's a as i said earlier it's, it's sort of around about um decreasing the cost of, of the ownership of the assets, you know, the roading, the, the water, um, the schools, understanding the capacity of those, those assets. So are you hitting sort of an excess capacity on it and do you need to upgrade it, you know? I think big it comes one. down to this yeah. um, easy use of the technology as well. I think it really comes down to, you know, will it make life simpler? I mean, it should do. Um, I think that a huge part of, you know, what everyone here is trying to do and, and what these tools are, are trying to do is remove that barrier to, so that anyone can start doing it, so that anyone can start to um, understand that data and actually do it in a way that's not complicated. Um, so, I, and I think that whenever you make data and the understanding and translation of that data more relatable to people, to make it more friendly to people, is whenever people start caring and when people can start understanding how their decisions can impact the, the wider world. Um, so I, I think it will make things a lot easier. I think that the sort of utilization of all the technology that we've seen um, and heard about is part helping along that process. And to add to it is uh, when thinking about the size of the projects from the past, from like 20, 30 years ago, they were much smaller buildings and less complicated buildings than the buildings of today. We didn't have as much technology integrated into our built environment um, as we do today, and it's only going to increase. So if we didn't leverage a technology to help people do the maintenance work, do the decisions, etc., it would be quite impossible to... Uh, manage these mega projects uh, when they are already in operations. I guess the, the Wellington project is a really good example of this, Tim. Is this, can you tell us a bit about how that came about, what the reaction of it's been, what's the kind of impact been with you know, in that kind of real world example with a, with a real local government? We've been working on this 3D model uh, for the last probably four or five years. Um, uh, first, I just have to say that the team here, um, I'll just name some names because they've been doing an amazing work. Vincent, Alex and Christopher have spent a lot of time on this model um, and a lot of late nights. <laughs> it's a real passion project for everybody here. But um, yeah, we, we started uh, this, this 3D model four or five years ago as uh, basically to visualise future projects to help the public understand what 
the counts were, were wanting to do um, and also help stakeholders understand that as well. And from there, we sort of, I suppose, looked at this 3D model asset that we had and we felt that it had a life beyond just, you know, the animation or the still image or, or the visual simulation, which is the accurate photo montage. And we wanted to bring it into an ecosystem like Unreal Engine to firstly make it more accessible, you know, with an executable people can download and maybe play around with it, but also uh, a, a more powerful visual tool and, and something that becomes more of an experience. And I think um, the experience is a big thing for me um, because people who can experience something will remember more <laughs> than, let's say, information that's provided to them in written format or, or maybe an image. So we basically converted the, the model from uh, 3ds Max with a, a bunch of different tools. Some of them are custom tools that we've developed ourselves. Um, we've used tools like Datasmith as well um, to bring those assets across to Unreal Engine. And then uh, basically the team really wanted to push the, the fidelity as, as far as we could um, and, and try and bring it to life as much as we could because a, a high fidelity 3D model that looks real, uh, you know, you could fly around, almost drop down to street level and it, and it, it you know, with the sun, the clouds, the, the environmental effects, everything like that, it's so much more powerful somebody to, to see that and then to plug in that data, to plug in those new buildings, to actually see them at street level, understand what, what they're like, um, is, is, is super powerful. Um, being able to jump into VR and actually experience it is, is amazing as well. So I think you're bringing it, bringing it into a system which, which is a lot more personable and a lot more easy to understand for the general public. In terms of the council, they're, they're incredibly excited about possibilities using this that, you know, going to public consultation uh, out there and we've, you may have some angry people or happy people uh, you know, wanting to talk to you about certain projects. Being able to utilize a tool like this where they can rotate around, zoom to any location, um, provide people with the confidence of what they're doing is, is, is for the good, for the best of, of you know, the environment or for the community, um, is, that's just incredibly powerful. And it's not just taken from one point of view, it's not one image, or a linear animation which people say, oh, well, you didn't, you didn't show me from this street and, and I don't, you know, I feel like it, it would be bad, you know. You can prove it right there and then. There's no, nothing hidden. It's open, out there in the open for people to, to view. There was a white paper that was released in the UK about the future of planning and I think that there was a stat in it which I find super fascinating which was said 1% of citizens actually engage in their um, sort of urban planning or their developments. And, you know, that's a very small amount of, you know, people to engage in, you know, how their neighborhoods and how their cities are going to develop. So how do you increase that number? How do you make that more accessible? How do we pump up those numbers? Um, and I think that exactly what you described, and this is on a city scale, um, I think the way that you described it, of, you know, making it easier for people to understand and get involved and understand these complex um, developments that are going throughout their city are crucial to um, community engagement on these projects and I think that that always has to be sort of kept in mind it's not just for creating it simpler for the building owner but also for the stakeholders that you know have a vested interest in those developments and um, so yeah I, I think there's a huge need for it in sort of the city planning side of things especially. Yeah I, I was a extended reality developer before joining Microsoft and where I saw the power of using the 3D models and the, the photorealistic experiences is that it's building up the muscle memory for people so they can train in digital um, room before going out there into uh, the actual world. They already can see where there are safety issues or security issues that then uh, they can already prepare for that. Same thing with um, like city planning, that you want to expose the plan to the, uh, the citizens before it's actually implemented and, and test out what kind of feelings and emotion do you extract from people? And is there anything that is a negative feeling or a negative emotion? Do people feel that they are unsafe if they were in that environment physically? And that way resolve things digitally before implementing them physically and that way avoid issues, avoid problems and test it out as many times as needed in digital format and then creating the, the physical twin. That's huge. I love that phrase, building up the muscle memory. That's such a, that's such a great way of putting it. I have to confess when Tim was explaining uh, the Wellington example, my hairs were literally standing on end with excitement about 
the hearing the potential of it coming to coming together in real life probably makes me very sad and a proper geek but that's that's how i felt when you were telling that story <laughs> such is the potential i guess yeah no there's there's heaps of potential um and i think we're only you know we're only scratching the surface like the very 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 tip of the, the iceberg it's yeah it's very exciting uh, David, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about uh, 51 World, this truly incredible Beijing-based uh, developer, 51 World, who've done uh, a digital twin of Shanghai. Uh, well, they've done a digital twin of Sh Singapore, which is uh, incredibly impressive and kind of does the things that you'd expect a, a digital twin to be, and is a great example. But then, whole different league, this 4,000 square kilometer model of Shanghai. I mean, that is, you have to see it to believe it. It's just, it's truly mind blowing, isn't it? It is. It's, it's amazing what and we're seeing across the world and, and these digital twins, you know, from the Wellington model and the sort of interaction with the council all the way through to what's happening with 51 World, with where they're sort of building these digital twins around sort of transportation links while they're building these digital twins around sort of understanding pedestrian flows through cities. So I, I think that there's different tiers of, of data and how these can be understood and, and how people can use these tools. I guess for people listening who think this is a great idea, they, they've kind of connected with the vision of it, they think they, it's something they want to get involved with. How do you get started? How do you take that first step going from, you know, what you're doing at the moment to being on the way to having your first digital twin? This kind of taps into, uh, I think, about cloud and how there is still a lot of reluctancy in the built environment industry to start adapting to cloud. And as the easiest step is to uh, adopt to cloud as an infrastructure. Instead of uh, saving data into our own PCs and, and phones, push it into the cloud so it's easier to access by yourself, but also to share with others. And when the readiness builds up, then adopt to a cloud as a platform and have your partners and solution providers develop solutions for you, for your organization to make life easier for you. And then when you are most advanced, um, cloud as a service, start developing solutions that you can sell to your customers and that way benefit yourself again from, from the cloud and everything that it has to offer. So that's my spin on things that uh, let's start from the lowest level, uh, saving data into the cloud, using it as an infrastructure and then scaling from there. So, I mean, Tim, on the Wellington model, what were what were the initial steps? How did it how did it start out? It should be kind of helpful to know what were the first things that happened. Well, there's been there's actually been a couple of digital twin projects. If I think about it, um, the first one we we actually worked on was actually with the America's Cup Team New Zealand, who are basically designing this race boat utilizing a digital twin, which was in their simulation software called Gomba, and uh, they would put thousands of sensors over this boat. Um, they would stream that data back to headquarters. They would then take that data, you know, manipulate the shape of the boat within this this uh, physics uh, engine of theirs to take into account aerodynamics and fluid dynamics. And then, you know, we were tasked with this 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 job of creating something that the public could jump on and and play uh, and actually um, experience it. And you know, when we took this project on, we all sort of looked at each other and went, "How how are we going to do this?" Um, <laughs> I'm sure Unreal. We, we can do it with Unreal, and it really is just jumping in and, and just giving it a go, <laughs> um, and just learning from it. Um, there's, there's no other other way of, of tackling it, really. I think for for people watching as well, and obviously we've spoken quite a bit about Wellington, we've spoken about Singapore, Shanghai. There's also Project Anywhere as well, but there's there's a whole range of use cases here, aren't there? This isn't just about buildings and cities. This is infrastructure, the energy sector, all, all kinds of different things. Mm. Mm. No, absolutely. And that, it goes back to what, you know, the America's Cup example there is, you know, um, adding to that, we found that because we visualized this in Unreal Engine, there was an actual other factor that they hadn't taken into account with maybe, let's say, the Gombok uh, simulation software is when their sailors were actually training on it, um, the graphics that we were able to provide, you know, subtle things like shadows on water or, or refraction in water of the foil underneath the water, we heard back from the sailors that, wow, hang on a second, you know, the value of that, that visualization on top of all the simulation as well was, was super powerful. So I know now they're looking at Unreal a lot, a lot closer. <laughs> the great thing as well is it touches every part of the industry. So, and yeah, whereas those, they've always been kind of siloed, we had, you know, we had architects, we had manufacturers, we had the contractors, we had end users and operators. 
they're now all in one silo and they're all sharing the same information and passing that kind of you know through the process and they're all looking at the the same thing ultimately the same digital twin so that's yeah that's a, that's a huge step because at the moment most people kind of you know the pass things on through these different silos during the project process but this kind of shatters all that which i guess is a pretty big cultural hurdle you know for people looking to get started in this i mean we've talked about get going and everything which which is great but it's quite a big step for a lot of people isn't it yeah and, and the data visualization is, is something that really helps us uh, be more empathetic to the others that are either the stakeholders or shared decision makers or the end users because uh, when when asking the same question from different end users of the digital twin or the visual data you will get very different answers uh, unless uh, they are all listening to each other and then just uh, replicate what the other one said. But overall, that, that it's, Digital Twin can kind of uh, bring light and expose the unknown uh, and that way help us understand and why are other people thinking about the same project very differently from what our perspective is. And, and that way the projects and, and the build environment that we are developing can be more inclusive of everyone and we can start addressing it more with the universal design approach than, than something that is uh, based on guidelines and like design strategies per company. Uh, it, it will be easier to uh, work as a, as a industry. And we spoke earlier on about where the industry's moved to in the space of, of 10 years and how the landscapes really change. The, the, the ground's much more fertile because of the the wider digitization of the world around us, there's much more ability now to adopt digital twins. I guess that's looking back 10 years, but I want to ask each of you, in 10 years time, where do you see digital twins? Where do you where do you think they'll be? Where do you hope they'll be? I'll ask that to each of you in turn, starting with David, if that's okay. Oh, I think I should go last. I've got, I've got a good one. <laughs> you ruined my transition. <laughs> well, 10 years from now, I'm hoping that digital twins are adopted as the the industry standard. Uh, that's what is being used as a primary tool for for delivering the build environment and continue to improve it. Um, but yeah, we'll see how how the industry adopts and what kind of components the different stakeholders and and disciplines want to integrate with the digital twin, so that it becomes a commercially feasible solution. And um, I'm hoping that it's not uh, seeing the same kind of uh, path as building information models saw 20 years ago, but uh, we can learn from the past and, and do better this time. But uh, I'm confident that within 10 years, the industry doesn't have a choice but start using digital twins and, and be successful at it. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that uh... Yeah, we'll, we'll see more and more of this um, being used in, in a range of different industries, but in terms of the architecture and, and urban design and planning, um, you know, I'd like to think that these virtual city models become, a, you know, a true twin of a city that you're covering everything from not, not just, you know, things like traffic and other things that we had talked about earlier, but but maybe even social aspects of a, of a city and, and how people feel about different areas and kind of plugging that sort of information in as well. So for me, the, the big thing is, you guys have all touched on it, which is great, is this um, idea of a larger metaverse. I know this term gets thrown around a lot. We see a lot of mention um, about it. And the kind of this idea of a metaverse is a digital representation of a physical space where we can socialize, live, work and play. Um, and I really believe that the digital twins are the foundations of that. We need to start building on that. So exactly what Tim just said, this idea of having a digital version of the city that runs in parallel to that city and um, where you can do more than just go in and understand data, but you can actually interact with it. They can have this big sort of helping hand in crafting that. They can have the, this kind of help in actually making that futuristic thing a reality. Yeah, for me, I mean, I'd, I'd hope we'd not just made the change in a behavioural sense in the industry, but in society as well. You know, I hope there'd be a lot more buy-in in 10 years' time from people who use these buildings who you know, genuinely care about how they're operating, how they're performing, uh, you know, what the use case is like. Because at the moment, we tend to... We don't think about our buildings the way we should do. We don't. Uh, you know, we focus very much on capital costs around the world rather than on the full-time, you know, long-term running costs. So... For me, I hope there's that culture shift in the next 10 years. It'll be interesting to see whether or not that happens. 
You'd be happy to be at home with your VR goggles on. Yeah. <laughs> when I last left home in 2020, I remember. I remember what the shops were like. <laughs> Well, it's been a truly fantastic discussion. Thank you so much to all of our panelists and thank you also to all of you for watching as well. And we'll see you soon.